You know, in the parable of the sower, the seed is sown very liberally. Everyone, it seems to me, gets a chance or an opportunity to hear the gospel, to hear the word of God. Everyone, it seems. The seed is cast out for all to hear. But it also seems that not everyone responds equally. For some, when they hear the truth about their need for God, it falls on deaf ears. It's like they just can't be bothered to even consider it, and so very quickly the message is lost. And I think we probably all know people who are a bit like that, don't we? You try and share the gospel or something important with them, and it's like it just goes straight over the top of their heads. For others, and again we've seen people like this, they appear to get very excited about faith in God. But again, it's all on the surface. It's like a new toy. And very soon the novelty wears off, especially when they realise <coughs> the level of commitment that's required. Or maybe they start to get it in, a neck, in the neck from their friends for attending church or something like that. They turn up for a week or two, and then you don't see them again. You hop on the phone and give them a ring and have a chat. And uh, they make promises, vague promises about coming along, and uh, which they never keep, and so on. I think we've all seen people like that. And then there are others for whom there seems to be an understanding about what's required, but there are competing calls in their life. It's like they see it, they understand it, but they struggle with letting go completely. They wrestle with handing the reins of their life over to God. And not long later, they go back to living their own life on their own terms, without any reference to God. In a way, I think that's just a sign of the ongoing or lingering rebellion that we have against God, that rebellion that first alienated the human race from God way back at Adam and Eve. And lastly, there are those who hear the message, they grasp what it means, they understand the implications for living their lives, and they make a choice to live for God to the best of their abilities from that point on, with the enabling of the Holy Spirit. And for those people, God honours them, and they are fruitful. Now here's the thing. Sometimes we like to think all people are made equal in the sense that if you give them the same message and you give it in the same way that they're all going to respond equally. The trouble is, the reality is, they don't. People aren't all the same and people will not all respond in the same way. Some people, no matter how hard you try and win them over to God, are just not either going to get it, want it, or be willing to make the sacrifice required. So why is that? Why is it that some people jump on board with the gospel, understand it, want to live their lives by it, and why is it that other people just seem to constantly struggle and wrestle with letting God be that, that part in their lives? I would suggest to you that it's a reflection of two things. Number one, our individual uniqueness and the freedom to choose that then comes from being created as personal <coughs> beings. Two traits that then manifest themselves in an ongoing state of rebellion against our Creator. As human beings, we were made with the ability to choose, to determine, in a sense, our own destiny. We have the ability to determine what we're going to do with our lives. However, despite the fact that our potential as human beings was only ever going to fully be realised when we are in that right place with the God who made this universe, Many human beings persist in a fruitless independence and rebellion that costs them and robs them of life in all its fullness. You only need to pick up the newspapers and switch on the TV to see the results of that rebellion against God. God puts his hands out to the human race and says, Come to me. I'm the one who made you. And I made you in a very special way, which is only realised when you come into a relationship with me. And even when presented with that, and even when some of them understand it, they still persist in choosing to live a life in rebellion against God. And we wonder why people's lives in the world is in the mess that it is in today. What I know for certain is that for some people, despite hearing the message, they will choose not to make a life choice to follow God. But you know, conversely, it also means that for those who do choose to follow God, that God will honour them. And they will produce, as it says in the parable and in the message translation, a harvest beyond their wildest dreams. And you know, the interesting thing about the parable of the sower is that even for those who are the good soil, there's kind of like about a, 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 a there is a variety of harvests. For some, they're going to produce 30-fold. 
for some 60-fold, for some 100-fold. So even for those who choose to follow God, the fruitfulness of those individuals will depend on how much of their life they're willing to give over to God and to live by God's values. Even amongst us as believers, it's not all going to be the same. It's the choices we make. It's what we choose to do with our life. How much place are we giving God in our lives that will result in how fruitful we are as Christians? And God both values and honours that ability to choose within us and he enables us to live that Christian life with the presence of his Spirit. You know, it's an exciting thing, allowing the Holy Spirit to move in you and to guide you and to see the things that happen as you seek to live your life guided by the Spirit. It really is. Which brings me to Psalm 1. A psalm that is all about the choices that people make and the consequences that come from those choices. If I were to ask you today, what is it that people are looking for most in this world, what would you answer? What would you answer? Love. People are looking for love? Yep. Peace. 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 Acceptance. Adoration. You reckon? You reckon people are looking to be adored? That might be nice. Do you adore me, Nikki? <laughs> yeah, the average rock star might want the attention. They're probably because yeah, probably they're struggling with low self-esteem. I don't know. You know, if you were the surveys that have been doing. Because they want attention, because they want love, don't they? Yeah. The pollsters, when they survey people, what they discover is that what people want most in life is happiness. What most people are looking for in this world is happiness. They want to be happy more than anything else. And if they happen to answer that what they really want is money, a car, a house, a better relationship, maybe an iPhone, it's usually because they think that by getting one of those things that it's going to somehow or other make them happier. You know, we've probably all fantasised at some point about winning lotto. Imagine how you would spend $11 million if you got it. I know I have. Has anyone else? Yeah, we all have, haven't we? If only I could win first division, some say, then I'll be happy. Trouble is, it's not really true. The reality is that for most people who win big at Lotto, they blow the money within the first six months. And more often than not, end up in a worse place than when they started. Their, their relationships, you know, it's like when a will gets read out, you know. Uh, there is a lot of stuff that goes on when people win big, and a lot of people fail at it which is why the Lotteries Commission has actually set up a very special group of people which is there to advise people who win big about the issues that they're going to be facing and about what they can do with their money. Money doesn't make you happy. And yet happiness is what most people seem to be searching for in this world. And that's why Psalm 1 is so interesting because it begins with the words, happy is the one. And then goes on to list a series of actions to be avoided if you really want to be happy. The word for happiness is a Hebrew word, it's esher, and it's, you, it's translated in a number of different ways. Uh, blessed, bliss, or one who is envied with desire. One who is envied with desire. And I think we've all seen people who seem to have that, that state of inner contentment and happiness in life, and we all think, oh, it'd be great to be like that. It comes from a root word meaning to walk straight without stumbling. And it gives the impression of a life that's moving forward, true and free, without hiccups, without obstacles, and clear of those things that make life less than ideal. And wouldn't we all want a life like that? I think we would. But such a state is only possible, the psalmist tells us, when certain activities are avoided and other choices followed. It's not an automatic state. Happiness only comes because we choose to follow a certain path in life and avoid others. Happiness, the psalmist tells us, is a consequence of our actions. It's not a reward for good behaviour. It's a consequence of our actions. It's not a reward for good behaviour. It's how we choose to live that will result in us ending up and living lives that are content. So let's have a closer look at Psalm 1. The first thing you should note about Psalm 1 is it's the first of the psalm. It's more than likely being very specially crafted and constructed to sit like a gatekeeper to the rest of the 150 odd psalms that there are. It's there to kind of like give us a bit of a summary of the wisdom that can be gained as you browse through the rest of Israel's hymnal. 
Because by the time you get to the end of the Psalms, if you read through the Psalms, you're left with only two conclusions. Number one, that despite all the ups and downs in life, there is really only one reality. One reality. And that is that God exists, and only when we are truly connected with God will our lives ever reach that state of inner contentment. And number two, if you try and live your life as though God did not exist, it's not really a viable alternative. We live in a country where 90% of the people here don't go to church. And while more than 10% might acknowledge there's more to life than meets the eye, most people are not really seriously seeking to search out how to get that inner contentment in all its fullness. The literary genius Thoreau once said, and you'll all probably know this quote, most men live lives of quiet desperation. Or to put it as Viktor Frankl once said, Clinics all over the world are crowded with people suffering from a new kind of neurosis, a sense of total and ultimate meaninglessness of life. Our society, by casting off God and by even denying his very existence, has condemned both itself and its individual members to a slow but inevitable slide into, into a meaninglessness and into death. Which is why this psalm is so crucial because it offers us an alternative, a light, a way out of the darkness if we are willing to let God truly be God in our lives. Psalm 1 points to the cure. So let's have a bit of a read. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the ungodly or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers, but instead their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on the law, this law, they meditate day and night. So what do we have here? To put it another way, as it says in the New International Version, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. And the words counsel, way, and seat refer here to the realms of thinking, behaving, and belonging in an individual. First up is something to be avoided if you want a happy and fulfilling life, is the counsel of the wicked. Or to put it another way, the advice of the ungodly. Throughout scripture, if you read through the scripture, what you find is that the wicked are those who are portrayed almost always as those who reject God. They don't want a bar of God, even to the point of denying his existence. Psalm 10 verse 4. In his pride, the wicked does not seek God. In all his thoughts, there is no room for him. Job 21. Who is the Almighty, the wicked say, that we should serve him? What would we gain by praying to him? The wicked, it seems to me, are those who say in a very deliberate way, there is no God. They are those who turn away from God and they reject him from any part of their lives. They don't see God as even being relevant. And their counsel or advice for life, their counsel or advice to you would be, Humanity doesn't need God. We can get along quite well by ourselves. And thank you very much. We don't need you, God. Get out of the picture. And if we were to walk in their counsel, if we were to follow that advice, if we were to mould our thinking after that, then the ultimate result would be a life without meaning, a life without happiness, and life, ultimately, a life one of despair. You reject God from your life in a very deliberate, conscious kind of way. You will end up in a place of despair. The second thing we are to avoid, according to the psalmist, is to take the path that sinners tread. And here we're talking about behaviour. Every one of us, I think, to some degree, have an awareness of right and wrong. Within each of us, there is a residual conscience that God's Spirit constantly tries to reach out to us through. For most of us in our world today, that conscience has been crushed, buried and distorted because of our modern world. And yet they're still there to a small degree. Sinners are those who persist, who know what it is to be, do right and yet persist in doing the wrong. They are not those who know that it's wrong to lie, yet will lie anyway. They are those who know that it's wrong to steal, but will continue to steal. Over a third of New Zealanders report that in a given year, they experience either a theft from their property or their car over the last 12-month period. And that's just in one year. 
We live in a society where the values of the past, grounded in the reality of a creator, are being cast off. And as that happens, as a society, we are rapidly sliding into a moral abyss. If we choose to live life according to that kind of lifestyle, then we will be living lives that ultimately will be ones of fear, they will be devoid of trust, filled with broken communities and fragmented families. And I see it all the time. When people start to live a life where they are deliberately disobeying the things that they know that they should do that are right, I see it so many amongst um, non-Christian young adults who, who are slipping into lifestyles where drugs and alcohol are so much part of their life here in Grand. And, and you see the breakups and you see it on, on Facebook and, and, the, and the language and everything like that. And it's just a fragmentation going on within our communities and within, within, our, within our families. And that's what comes from choosing to go in that direction. And finally the psalmist tells us that in order to avoid unhappiness, we need to avoid sitting in the seat of scoffers. And scoffers are those who go one step further, beyond not believing or rejecting God. They openly scoff and make fun of the fact that there is a God. They will ridicule your belief in God, and they'll get angry when you try and talk about God. It's a bit like burning your bridges once you've crossed over them. Once you're across, you're too proud to admit that you might have been wrong, and you end up becoming bitter and twisted on the inside. Because to scoff at God is to position yourself very deliberately, not accidentally, but very deliberately in opposition to God. And such a choice ultimately again can only bring unhappiness. And that first verse, the psalmist has given us a path that if we choose to follow it, to walk in the counsel of the wicked, to stand in the way of sinners, or to sit in the seat of scoffers, will bring us a life that will be very, very unhappy. But imagine if you flip that verse around and put it in a positive way. Oh, the happiness of the man who actively chooses to live by the counsel of the godly, who lives his life according to God's way, and in all things acknowledges the lordship of God over this world and his life. That's what will bring you happiness. And in the next two verses in the psalm, the psalmist goes on to present a picture of what that person is like. Happy. Firstly, the happy person is someone who loves the Bible. Their delight is in the law of the Lord. And to me, that word delight speaks of emotions, doesn't it? It speaks of joy. It's a person, a happy person then, is someone who gets excited about the Bible. Whenever they read it, they see it lived, or they hear it preached. This is the person who does more than just get excited, though, about the Bible. They're a person who also meditates on it day and night. In other words, they spend time regularly reading it, memorizing it, and applying it to their life. Getting into it and drawing out the truth from it. Thinking about what God may be wanting to say to them through the scriptures. They see it as a guide as to how to live their lives. Now that's a huge challenge. Because we all know that Anglicans especially <coughs> struggle with reading the Bible. We're pretty good in this parish actually. When I've asked you before how many of you read your Bibles regularly, most of you put up your hands. I mean, how many read their Bibles every day? That's a good percentage. You know, in the normal Anglican church, it's one in ten. But you know, it's more than just reading it. <clears throat> I read my Bible every day. But I don't always get into it in depth unless I'm preparing a message. But that's what God calls me to do. You know, what do I invest my money in? <clears throat> Fiction works? Or maybe I want to go and buy a few commentaries. Maybe I want to go and buy a Bible dictionary. What resources do you have to help you get into the scriptures? If you're serious about delighting in the law, delighting in the Bible, in scriptures, then invest some of your resources in those things that are going to help you draw out the truths that are in the Bible. Are you a part of a home group? Do you have a prayer partner? What things are you doing to grow as a Christian? Because if you're doing those things, the psalmist would say that you are then like a tree planted by streams of water. A, a tree that will yield fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. And that whatever you do will prosper. And the psalmist is telling us here that just as a tree is nourished by water, so a person who reads their scriptures will find nourishment for life in its pages. Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect. It revives the soul. 
The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. They will make you wise. The precepts of the Lord are right. They will give joy <coughs> to the heart. And the commands of the Lord are radiant. They will give light to the eyes. As you can hear, there are so many benefits that will come from reading the scripture. But what does it mean to yield fruit in season? Imagine if you were an orchardist. You've got hundreds of trees sitting in your orchard. But they're trees that don't fruit in season. They fruit at any old, old time of the year. Would they be useful trees? Could you run an orchard successfully with trees like that? No, you couldn't. You wouldn't know when to hire pickers. You wouldn't know when to spray. You couldn't control your income. You wouldn't know when you could deliver orders and so on. Such trees would be useless as opposed to those that fruited in season. Those trees would be reliable and dependable. And that's what the psalmist is saying. A person who regularly reads the Bible will develop a character which is trustworthy, reliable and dependable. And when he talks about leaves that don't wither, he's talking about a freedom from drought which conjures up images of dryness and barrenness of being alone and empty. In times of trouble, a person who is nourished by the scriptures will not need to despair or give up because God will be close at hand and they will have the inner resources to deal with what they're going through. God, through the Spirit, is the stream of living water that will satisfy their thirst and sustain their life. Remember Psalm 23? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. If you are a person who immerses your life in the Scriptures, God will be with you to sustain you even in the hard times. The psalmist began by referring to a life or to a path that we should avoid. And at the end of the psalm he returns to that path. And he outlines what happens to those, the final end of those who choose not to walk in God's ways. The ungodly, we are told in verse 4, are like chaff, that the wind just blows away. Chaff, as you know, is the husks or shells of wheat and grain. It's good for nothing. It has no substance. The ungodly, like chaff, are just empty husks. By rejecting God, they have cut themselves off from the very source of life. And as a consequence, they will not stand in the judgment. At judgment day, they won't, as it were, have a leg to stand on. When God reveals how he tried to reach them through Christ, through the prophets, through the scriptures, and through the living witness of Christians. Because and because of this, they have effectively cast themselves out of a place in the assembly of the righteous. The ungodly will not be with us in God's kingdom at the end of time. And the psalm concludes by telling us that God watches over the way of the righteous because we have chosen his way. And the message for us today is this. That true happiness only comes, true happiness, only comes from knowing and loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind and body. Because he is the only reality. And that is a choice that we are free to make or not make every day of our lives. It's our choice. What will you choose to do? How will you choose to live your life? I can't make you a better Christian. Only you can choose whether to follow God's pattern for your life or not. Only you have the power to do that. But know that when you do choose that, that God will enable it through his Holy Spirit. But it still in the end comes down to your choice. God calls, God offers, but what will you choose? Let us pray.